Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Erwin Vasquez, uh, and the company is Abdullah and Daniel. And today we are presenting on spacecraft thermal management system. So, a quick overview of our project. So, our goal is to create a radiator plate with a variable massivity film on it that will go on CubeSat 3 satellite. Um, so a bit of background on the variable maturity devices. Uh, there's already been work done in the aerospace industry, but we hope to improve on them by um, making it more economical, both in terms of power consumption and actual cost. Uh, so our project is separated into three sub-teams, that is hardware, software, and chemical. I am the hardware team lead, Abdul is the software team lead, and I am the chemical team lead. So a bit about our design requirements, uh, they're mainly based around the orbit of CubeSat 3 or any satellite that we would put the radiator on. So as the satellite goes around its orbit, it's going to go through a certain thermal cycle depending upon the position and orientation of the satellite. It's going to either be uh, the direct sunlight where it will be warmer or cooler when it's in the shadow. Uh, and another of our design requirement is that all components have to be, uh, have to work in a vacuum, uh, especially the, uh, the variable emissivity film. So now to hardware, uh, there are five team members in, uh, in our hardware sub-team, and our main objectives are thermal thermal calibrating, uh, uh, vacuum chamber testing, and creating the actual radiator plate itself. So, a bit about thermal couple calibration. So, we're using T type thermal couples, and these are the same thermal couples that we used uh, when we tested the first radiator at Boeing using their vacuum. Uh, so, the purpose of using the thermal couples is to correlate the data to the thermal model uh, and uh, calculating the so for calibrating, we are calculating the error in these thermal couples and calculating the thermal efficiency of the radiator itself. Uh, so like I said, with the cycles of, uh, that the satellite would go under, uh, this data here is uh, some of the data that was acquired at Boeing. So as you can see, um, it will fluctuate uh, in temperature going from hot to cold, so on and so forth. Uh, and this is actually the plate that was tested. So, as I previously mentioned, uh, the last radiator plate was tested at Boeing this past summer uh, in their vacuum chamber. And uh, the vacuum chamber we're using here is a triple lot of 80. So right now we can get it down to about 2 torr, uh, and its maximum pressure can get down to about 7 times 10 to the negative 8 torr. So we're currently working on getting that 2 torr down to at least 10 to the negative 6 torr. Uh, in order to do this, we are troubleshooting the pump and chamber, and we're working with Professor Gamero on testing the various components of the vacuum chamber, which include uh, pressure gauges, the pump, uh, and seals. So this is the actual radiator plate. Uh, one on the left is the previous one, and the one on the right is our newer one. <coughs> so the biggest change is how we're heating the plate. So as you can see, for the older one, uh, we used uh, in-house made heaters that go around, so those are small rectangular uh, metal pieces. And we replaced that with an actual heating strip, which is the top of the thing in the middle. So the heating strip we actually got from Boeing, and it was specifically made to work in a vacuum. So we hope that this can uh, better heat the plate. Uh, and so the objective are, of our vacuum chamber test uh, are to calibrate our thermal couple data uh, and see how it correlates with the uh, thermal model, uh, and also to calculate the thermal efficiency of the radiator. Uh, that we would go and get plugged down without using their vacuum chamber. 
and also to check the functionality of the bill. Uh, and so now I'll pass it off to Abdullah who will talk to you about, uh, about software. Um, hello, my name is Abdullah and I'm a software team lead for uh, Spacecraft uh, Work Systems. And um, I, can, I have two members who work with me, Nick and Brian. Um, me and Nick are working on the console model and Brian is working on the SDK model and basically what we're trying to, our main objective here is to be able to model the radiators in the vacuum in the console and, um, and also model our satellite in, uh, in SDK to understand how the solar intensities and solar flux and how the heat loads are affected on a very time of day by using a specific orbit. Um, the main reason we're doing this is because we want to be able to compare our results with the hardware team and then by doing that we can correlate our data um, and then after that use it to be able to model our spacecraft in space. So for the console model, um, basically what we have here is um, uh, we built first in the, the, the radio was already built since last year of spring, but we just modified it, added the vacuum chamber in SOLIDWORKS, and then imported that into console. And then from that, we were able to uh, put in uh, uh, parameters such as um, ambient temperature, the amount of power dissipated from the heaters and radiators, um, thermocouples, and we also added in, um, uh, selected different types of materials so that way it can be. Um, almost exact to what the hardware team is, is using in their vacuum test. So then once, the, so the model is almost completely kind of now we're in that we're meshing, the, we're applying a mesh to the model to be able to um, run the simulation and hopefully compare the results within the next week with our hardware team. Yeah. This PowerPoint. I just realized uh, you guys have the wrong PowerPoint. Could we pause for just a moment and bring up the proper one? Yeah. Um, so for the console model analysis, uh, we're, we basically we built we got the radiator from last year's uh, uh, model and then uh, modified it all works and added the vacuum in, added the, the parameters as this is here. We designed the vacuum after the Boeing C3 shroud. Um, in case you guys want to know, C3 stand, uh, C3. It's basically cylinder three at the Boeing facility. That's what C3 stands for. Uh, but we just basically modeled it exactly as what Boeing has. And then uh, we set up the parameters in console, added all the temperatures, power, and, um, and uh, the thermal the, the studies. And, and now we're just applying the mesh into the console model, be able to find the simulation, and hopefully be able to compare the results with the hardware team and then adjust our model to be able to get within a 1% error uh, to be able to model our system then later in the space environment. So as you can see here, that's a picture of our model on um, the section view, and that's a little radiator. It's like within nine millimeters compared to the 367 millimeter wide back. All right, so that's a picture of, of the, uh, the current mesh um, we're working on, to be able to optimize the mesh and be able to hopefully not take forever to run the simulation. Um, and um, yeah, like I said, once we have the, once we run the simulation, we'll be able to compare the results with hardware. We'll go from there. So now moving on to the SDK software aspect. So basically SDK, you're able to uh, model uh, any kind of satellite, you want in an Earth orbit, and that's pretty much what we've done. We've used the SDK to model our CubeSat. When we're first starting off the one unit CubeSat, building to make sure like we're, we have the good data for that, and then after that we'll move on to the two unit, um, and then compare our data and see how we're how it's how, how it's going on. Um, so basically, what we're doing is we're using a plus and minus ten uh, degrees of polar inclination, and uh, that will be able to give us the maximum. Um, solar um, uh, load onto our uh, system. So here I have an animation of our model. Uh, so we have a 2D graph, which is how the orbit's going uh, around the Earth, and this is just 
see two stacks, and we can see it actually uh, go through the um, sugar and through the bomb. So I guess it's not the like, wrong way. Um, in that case, I'll just quickly explain. So I don't know if you can see the blue line. It's just, um, and it's, it's basically, it's in, it's in a time zone. So you can pick the time of day that the satellite will be orbiting. So when we launch, we want to make sure that we want to launch during daytime or nighttime to be able to, once the satellite reaches into orbit, it's following the sun and not following the, the night. Um, so it will actually tell us how the day is shifting by how, when, when, when is the, when is the earth dark and is the earth, uh, is, 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 is lighted up. And from that, we're able to uh, export our data to, um, to be able to get our solar flux, solar intensities, and heat loads on each side of the uh, CubeSat. So it has six sides. Okay. So here are our results um, from a little snapshot of our results. And basically, it spits out the temperatures. Uh, this is for one, the one side of the CubeSat. So we're looking at just one side, and from that, we're able to. And then we're going to look at each side and determine which one has the maximum and minimum um, solar intensities and solar, solar, uh, solar flux and temperatures. And now we're going to go to Daniel. Thank you. Um, as you said, I'm Daniel Pinkel. I'm actually a chemical engineer uh, brought to this project. And also, I met with teammates Ethan, Alejandra, and Noah to design a variable emission device. So here I'll be going over the theory, the application, and also uh, some applications in industry that we're drawing from in order to make this device. And what we hope to do is create a device in which we can vary the emissivity of it, um, range of between uh, 1, 3, and 0.8. So and essentially emissivity is how much heat can be uh, ready. Uh, okay, next slide. So essentially here at panel A is our basic uh, structure. Uh, you see the uh, two blue slides, those are actually going to be glass plates. And on them is going to be a layer of indium tin oxide, which is um, a protective layer. Um, I'll be referencing, referencing that as ITO from henceforth. And the uh, small white layer you see will be the titanium dioxide. That'll be our uh, electrochromic uh, substance. And we saturate with an electrolyte solution consisting of uh, uh, PC and lithium perchlorate. And on top of all that is going to be the black light, which you see up there, is the carbon catalyst. Uh, and then what we're going to, to do is clamping that all together and running a voltage through it. And what we hope to do is, depending on what voltage we put through this device, we'll bring a emissivity and get emissivity that is most optimal for us to use. Um, and exactly how running voltage will go through it, uh, what will change emissivity is shown here in panel B run a current through it, and it'll actually draw lithium ions into the titanium dioxide, but I'll go more into that later. Uh, here, panel C um, is more or less uh, showing how we are going to create it. Uh, the first part is going to be we testing two types of cells, one wet, one dry, and again, I'll go into that later. And then we deposit a layer of carbon on, either using a candle, but in this case, we're just using a pencil lead and just getting a nice coating right there. And then we clamp cell together. That's essentially how it's going to be made. And if you look at the cross section, this is the basic cross section. And over here in this picture, uh, you'll see the uh, movement of lithium ions. And lithium ions is what we're hoping it's going, or what we're expecting, is going to be changing the emissivity of the device. So titanium dioxide is initially white, and what we hope is that uh, by running current through this, uh, it's going to pull the lithium ions out of solution and actually um, diffuse into titanium dioxide, process them into insulation, and therefore change the emissivity. And then when we turn off, basically turn off our device, the lithium ions will diffuse back in solution. And that, that's, our, that's how we will vary the emissivity of our device. Uh, our basic procedure is essentially we take uh, powdered titanium dioxide and we basically make it into a paint by adding uh, acetic acid. And in order to like, in order to, for it to have an even spread over the plates, we add a little bit of surfactant to bring the surface uh, tension. And then, as soon as we create this uh, paint-like sub paint -like substance, we then will create our two cells, uh, the dry and the wet. 
for the drive, what we're going to be doing is, or what we have done, is put a, uh, we put some tape onto the glass slide, and then we put, uh, we apply a little bit of paint. And then what we do is that we take a glass rod and roll it over so that the layer has a uniform thickness, about the thickness of the tape. And then we put that onto a hot plate and leave it at 450 degrees Celsius for a little bit. And then we add solution to that, uh, the electrolyte solution, before we um, add an other slide with the carbonate position line. And as for the wet cell, instead of annealing it, uh, we just take our paste, mix it in with a little bit of that electrolyte, and then we apply that to the cell, and then uh, apply it to the slide, and then uh, clamp it together uh, with the carbonate position on top. Um, and then after we make these two cells, then we uh, do intercalation. And what we do is that, uh, from the top picture, you see that we hook a positive end to uh, one slide and negative end to another slide. And then we run about uh, 2.5 volts to it for a little bit. And then, uh, and then uh, essentially what that should do is that should uh, uh, diffuse the lithium ions into the layer. And as a result of that, we had a little bit of varied results. We saw that we had a little bit more distinct color change with the dry cell, which you see on the right. Um, and that's what we're looking for. We're looking for color change and looking for a completed circuit, uh, which we got with both. But for the dry cell, we definitely got color change, though it took a while for the color to dissipate, and it did not fully dissipate after, uh, even after half an hour of laying it uh, deep. Charge. Uh, for blood cell, we did see color change, although it wasn't as prominent. Uh, though it did respond better to inputs of current and did change more with uh, with our variation. And uh, to conclude our presentation, we'd just like to thank Boeing for allowing us to use their vacuum chamber in our tests, as well as Professor Gamero and Professor LaRue for helping us. Oh, I'm sorry, go back. <laughs> I didn't realize I uh, was reading the wrong side. I apologize. You know this one. Uh, for industry application, emissive films definitely aren't a new thing, but essentially what we're doing is trying to do it for lower cost and also uh, for less maintenance as well, because some emissive films require parts or moving fluids. Ours is purely, uh, purely passive and hopefully it will be. Um, low cost relative to some other emissive films which could range to the thousands, uh, for the size that we're working with. And some applications, as you can see, are in Air Force, in you know, space, the visors for the uh, spacecrafts or for the uh, astronauts, uh, as well as electrochromic film um, uh, glassware, which uh, can change the opaqueness, and then on uh, a sunny day, it can actually tint the windows, and then on a darker day, you can actually untint them. Just by applying voltage. And now I would like to thank Boeing for using, uh, for letting us use their equipment and their facilities to do our initial tests. And I'd like to thank uh, John Grew and Professor, McGar uh, Professor Romero for, uh, oh, as well as uh, other industry partners, in helping us to try to repair our, uh, our own vacuum chamber so we can do our own testing. And thank you for listening to us.